Harmony Baptist Church, providing a message of hope to the hopeless. Good morning, and thank you for joining us once again here for our online church service. Today is Sunday, May the 17th, and we just count it an honor and a privilege that you chose to spend your Sunday morning here with us. Let's open up in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity back in your house, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for the uh, that we're moving forward in this pandemic, Lord, and that we're going to be uh, back in here and with the congregation will be back in here shortly, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you'd continue to be with each and every one of our members, Lord. Just protect them. Uh, just give them your peace, Lord. Just uh, be with them during this time. Just uplift them, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, in the way of announcements, we'll go ahead and get started with the big one this morning. If most of you have heard uh, yesterday, the uh, federal court struck down the ban on having in-person church services yesterday here in North Carolina. Uh, so we just want to thank the Lord for that. So with that being said, everything today will continue online. I'll get up with our deacons this week and we'll come up with a plan so that we can get y'all back in here with us. But we are just... Uh, uh, very excited this morning that it looks like the end of the um, ban on church services is here and that we're going to be back and I'm going to be able to look and see y'all smiling faces versus just staring into the camera. So we're very thankful uh, for that. So be looking for details this week and uh, we'll let you know what, the, uh, what our game plan is and how we're going to uh, phase back into uh, having somewhat normal church services here. All right, in the way of other announcements, uh, birthdays this week want to wish uh, Ross Hall a big happy birthday. He is celebrating today. And then we want to ri wish Richard Smith and Heidi Wilson a happy birthday as they'll be celebrating their birthdays tomorrow. All right, that's it for birthdays and anniversaries this week. Um, if you have a prayer request, have a praise report, or if you'd like to get a copy of our prayer list, if you would just send me an email uh, to prayer at hbc-ramsur.org. Again, that's the word prayer, P-R-A-Y-E-R, at hbc-ramsur.org. And uh, we'll be glad to uh, pray with you, celebrate uh, the answer to prayer, or just get you a copy of our prayer list so you can pray along with us. Uh, if you would continue to mail in your tithes, offerings, mission offerings to us, we appreciate you thinking of the church during this time. Uh, you can send those to P.O. Box 849. That's P.O. Box 849. Ram sword and the zip is 27316. As always, during the services, we ask that you would like, share, subscribe, retweet, uh, help us get the word out on any of our platforms. Just as a reminder, uh, our main source is going to be the church's website, uh, or you can check us out on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We're on all three, as well as we have an Amazon Fire Stick app, and we'll have a Roku channel. So if you want to watch us on, uh, the big screen, all of those are options available to you. Uh, special thanks to all of our musicians who are sending music that plays during the countdown. Uh, I want to thank them for supplying that music. And uh, if there's any other music that you would like to add, you can feel free to send those in. The only requirement is that it's not copyrighted, and we'll be glad to add that music in to the rotation. All right, I think that about covers it for announcements this morning. If you have your Bible, if you'll be turning with me to the book of Ruth, Ruth and chapter number three. We're continuing our study here in the book of Ruth, moving right along on chapter number three. If you remember, as we started out uh, the first part of the chapter, we found Ruth who was living uh, with her mother-in-law, uh, Ruth is a Moabitess. They were living in the country of Moab. Uh, uh, Ruth, as well as her, uh, her husband, her father-in-law, and her brother-in-law had all passed away, leaving the three women in Moab. And then we see that Naomi and Ruth came back to uh, Israel, back to Bethlehem. And then in chapter 2, we see that um, Ruth had went out and started uh, gleaning uh, the barley and they were picking up the scraps and from the corners as was required by Jewish law and she was in Boaz's field. So that kind of brings us up to chapter number three. Now chapter number three is kind of a maybe a hard chapter for some of you but we'll try to break it down and go through it 
and help you and make sense of it. So we're going to start reading Ruth chapter number three, and we'll start reading there in verse number one. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is it not Boaz of our kindred, whose maidens thou waste? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he have, shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in, and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. And she went down unto the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of the corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet, and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid, and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaiden, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of the kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man hath done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he hath finished the thing this day. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be behind your pulpit, Lord. I just pray you would give me the words that you would have me to say and nothing else, Lord. I just pray you would just use this message, Lord. Take it out by way of internet, Lord. May it find lodging in the hearts of those listening, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we see here in Ruth chapter 3, this is kind of a, by our traditions and our customs, this is a chapter that we probably find a little harder to um, get into or to understand because a lot of it has to do with the Jewish customs. And we see here the picture of Ruth and Boaz. We're going to take the example of Ruth here and see how it applies to our lives even today. So we said in the way of background, we know that Boaz is a relative of her father-in-law. And she's a Moabitess, so she's back in Israel, a foreign land to her. But we know that under Jewish customs, that uh, it was when a woman was widowed, it was up to the husband's family, and the next of kin had first opportunity uh, to step up and to be her husband. Now that's something that's very strange in our customs, but that was the way things happened in Israel back then. All right. So we see a couple of things here. Ruth had a problem. She was a stranger uh, all alone except for her mother-in-law uh, back in Bethlehem. She was a foreigner, a stranger, and the only person she knew was Naomi, her mother-in-law. So Ruth had some problems. She had some things. She had no money. She had no land. Uh, she had no way to support herself. Uh, and of course, back then, the main way uh, women supported themselves uh, was through family, and in this case, through her husband's family. Of course, he's passed away, uh, so her next move is going to be 
to find a husband to support her. So we see that to, the first step we see is that to solve your problems and put your life back together, you should have the right purpose. The right purpose. We see here in chapter 3 that Ruth's purpose, purpose was a lasting relationship. Now we see here in the story of Ruth and Boaz, we see a lot of examples that's going to kind of foretell uh, our relationship with Jesus Christ or what should be our relationship with Jesus Christ. We see here that Ruth has a purpose. She is looking for a lasting relationship. Just as Christians, we should want and expect to have a lasting relationship with Jesus Christ. Sometimes, uh, Christians, we just miss the point that we just want to, our relationship with Jesus, all we want out of it is kind of for Jesus to be a problem solver. We don't necessarily want that full, long-term relationship. We're just kind of looking for somebody to swoop in, solve our problems, and then we're ready to kind of push him back aside and kind of put him back in the corner until we need him again. But that misses the whole point. We see here that Ruth was looking for uh, a lasting relationship just as we should look for a lasting relationship from Jesus. The second thing we see here to solve our problems and put our life together is we must go to the right person. The right person. First of all, we see here the kinsman redeemer, which is what Boaz would be. Uh, is in Jewish law and Jewish tradition, uh, the, the kinsman redeemer, uh, the first right went to the immediate relative. Normally that would be the husband's brother. The husband's brother. But of course we know uh, Naomi, both of her sons, passed away. But we also see in scripture there is one more uh, that would have been a closer relative than Boaz. So by tradition, first right went to the closest relative. Second right went to another family member, uh, if that family member was able and if he was willing. So what does a kinsman redeemer have to do with us in 2020? Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He is the one that is able to redeem us that is our kinsman. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So because of Jesus' sinless perfection, he is able to redeem us from sin. That is our biggest need as humans is that we need a redeemer. We need... We need Jesus Christ. There's no way we can pay the price. There's no way we can live a perfect life. For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We see here that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Just as Boaz is the kinsman redeemer for Ruth. Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. So we know that Jesus is able. But is he willing? If you would turn with me to John chapter number 10. We'll read two passages of scripture. John 10, we'll read verses 17 and 18. And it says, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. So we see that Jesus was willing he was willing to save us. He was willing to take our debt and go and pay it for us on the cross. And that's the biggie sometimes. I think a lot of times we miss it. Um, Jesus came from heaven. He lived up in perfection. He was perfect. But he came down here to an imperfect world that had been ruined by sin. And he lived here among us as humans for 33 years. Lived a perfect life. Never once sinned. So he did not deserve to go to the cross. But he did it because of love. He did it out of love for you and me. Because we've all sinned. And we couldn't pay our own price. We are debtors. There was no way. No matter how perfect we tried to be. Uh, how good we tried to be. How many good works we tried to do. There's no way we could live up to the standard to pay our price. Because we have all fallen. 
So we see that Jesus went to the cross and died for you and I and shed his blood. Went to the grave and came back in three days and rose again. And lives today in heaven all for you and I. So we see that Jesus is willing to save us. So we see that we have to have the right, pers the right purpose. We see we have to have the right person. The third thing we see is that we need to make the right preparations to solve our problems and put our lives together. The right preparations. We see here, Ruth chapter 3, that Ruth acted honorably. Verse 11 said that she was a virtuous woman. Now when we read chapter 3 and it says she went into where he was laying um, a lot of times, you know, just because of the way TV and movies and everything are, is our mind kind of wanders and we think that maybe there's more there than what's laid out in story. In the story, no, the Bible tells us that she did everything honorably. Both Boaz and Ruth acted honorably. There was nothing uh, that was done incorrectly or improperly. Uh, she was known as a virtuous woman. Now, one of the one of the questions that comes up in Ruth chapter 3 is, why did Naomi tell Ruth to go to Boaz at night? Scripture doesn't really give us a definitive answer, but a lot of scholars think that one possibility may have been so that Boaz could have rejected her, said, no, I don't want to play the part of the kinsman redeemer, and that way she could have said the whole town not have known about it. We don't really know why she went at night. Maybe it was so they could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation without all the, the servants and everybody around. But it's also an example for us that even when we go to Jesus Christ, we can go to him whether it's daytime, nighttime. Uh, he's never asleep. He's never too busy. He's never in a position where he doesn't care about us. So we can go to him at any time, day or night, just like Ruth went at night to Boaz. All right, in verse 3, Naomi told Ruth to wash herself. That speaks of our need to be cleansed from sin. We can't wash ourselves, but because Christ went and paid that price and shed his blood, we can be washed in the blood. So our sin can be washed away. We can be made white as snow. You see that reference here in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 3. Also in verse 3, Naomi tells her to anoint herself. The anointing of all speaks of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Letting the Holy Spirit control our lives is absolutely necessary for a close relationship with Jesus. Now this is one a lot of times we all know, we all understand, we all agree. It's just one that's kind of hard sometimes to actually put in practice. So we've talked about in earlier sermons, a lot of times we know that we need to be 100% committed, that we need to follow the Lord 100%, that we need to be fully on fire for the Lord, but a lot of times that's harder to do. It's easier to say that than it is to actually do it. Because a lot of times we want to hold on to those, uh, those pieces of our old life that we enjoy or that we like, and we don't want to fully sell out. You see here in the story of Ruth, she was fully sold out. She had left her home country. She had left her home city. She had turned away uh, from idol worship. She came to Bethlehem and she was worshiping the one true Lord. She had left everything behind. She literally came to Bethlehem with nothing but her mother-in-law. That's kind of the way we are when we come to Christ. We are to leave the old things behind. We're not to come dragging them with us. We're not to hang on to them. We're to totally let go and sell out for Jesus. Let all of that stuff go. All those things in the past that we've done, he washed us, he cleansed us, he broke those chains for us. He took us out of bondage and set us free. Jesus did his part, but our problem is we want to hang on to things. We don't want to let that grip go. We want to hold on to a little piece of our old life we want to hold on to those sins. We want to hold on to those things that we enjoy. We want to hold on to that pleasure because for some reason we don't believe that things are going to be as good on the other side with Jesus. It's another one of those lies the devil tells us that we believe. 
See, life with Jesus is going to be better than anything we had before. Living the good life. A lot of people, they want to hang on to something from the past, whether they want to hang on to drinking, whether they want to hang on to uh, whatever activities they were involved in because they think that, it's, that they can't give up that fun because, you know, when they live for Jesus, they got to give up all those things and life's just going to be dull and boring and that's just not the case at all. We know that, uh, that joy comes from the Lord, that when we totally sell out and we worship Him, we're following Him, we're doing everything that we're supposed to, that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So that, those, that we will have joy, we'll have fun, uh, we'll enjoy life. Life's not just supposed to be all downtrodden when we're with Jesus. We're supposed to be the victors, and we're supposed to enjoy life. So don't believe the lies that Satan tells you. Look at the example of Ruth. She totally left everything behind and came to a new land. Uh, the third thing we see there in verse 3 is, it says, is that Naomi told Ruth to put raiment upon her. That speaks of, in the physical, you know, she was taken off her widow garments. You know, a lot of times when we're in mourning, we want, tend to want to wear black, we wear dark clothing, kind of as an outward sign of our mourning. Naomi told Ruth, take off your mourning clothes, put on some fresh clothes. Just as Christians, that tells us that we are to put off the old man and put on the new. When we become Christians, we follow the Lord, we're supposed to look like it. We're supposed to act like it. We're supposed to be 100%. There again, don't hold on to the old. Get rid of it. Get rid of the old clothes. Put on the new raiment. We're supposed to look different. We're supposed to act different. We're supposed to be different all the way around. So we see that Ruth here, she, she had the right purpose. She was going to the right person. We see the third thing was that she was making the right preparations. The last thing we're going to look at is that she was in the right place. When scripture, when Naomi tells Ruth to go in, that she is to go in when he's laying down and to go to the place of his feet. Now, in our in 2020, in our culture, that just seems weird. But as was uh, at the time in Jewish uh, culture, Jewish traditions, uh, the place of the feet speaks of total submission. Uh, if you think about it and you think back to old times, you know, the times of kings and queens and whatnot, they had all the, 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 the rules for royalty and kind of the pomp and circumstances. And, you know, you always had to bow when you went in before royalty. And they had different customs than we have today. So being at the feet was one of total submission. So if you think about... Uh, if a king was sitting up here on the platform, you would come in and you would bow. When you bow, where are you at? You're at the place of the feet, right? You get down on your knees and you bow, you're at the, the royalty's feet. In this case, she was at Boaz's feet. It speaks of submission. Obviously, when you went in in olden times to the king and queen, you know, you went into the royal court, you bowed, you paid your respects, because, you know, they were in total control. If they would have looked at you and said, off with his head, it would have been gone, no questions asked. Uh, it was not like today, maybe we're, you know, we have our rights and we have our rules and we have our protections. You know, the king was all powerful. He was a total authoritarian and he was a dictator and whatever he said went. So, the place of the feet speaks of total submission. Just like in olden times they had to submit to the king, it speaks of us today in 2020 that to put our lives together and to solve our problems, we have to have total submission to the Lord, 100%. Uh, there is no place of, well, let's be 80% committed. Let's be maybe, well, 75, maybe that seems a little better. That's where a lot of Christians, we miss the boat. We don't want to sell out 100%. We want to still hang on to that little bit of our old life we still want to hang on to the world and when we know that uh, this world is not our home we're just passing through it and uh, we should think of ourselves kind of as uh, pilgrims just as we went to another country we wouldn't you know if you picked up and moved to europe today you know you wouldn't just keep loading up van after van after van of all your stuff from your life here in america you would go very light. You would take only the absolute necessary items, like you may just take your clothing. Your family, you'd hop on a plane or a boat. 
and you go to Europe and you'd go with very little. The example for us as Christians. When we become Christians, we ask the Lord to save us and we accept him as our Lord and Savior. We're to leave all that stuff behind. We're not supposed to just keep loading up the vans. We're just supposed to take with us really nothing, just ourselves. Because Jesus is our source for everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. <coughs> Excuse me. He supplies our every need. It's through his riches and Christ's glory that our needs are supplied. So we really have no need of anything else but him. So why are we still trying to hang on to all of this old stuff and drag it along with us? We have to be 100% sold out in total submission to him. So we see here in conclusion that to solve our problems and put our lives together and where they need to be, that we have to have the right purpose. We have to have the right person, Jesus Christ. We have to make the right preparations. We have to be at the right place to do that. If you're listening to me today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you about some preparations you need to make. How will we prepare to make Jesus our Lord? It's simple. A lot of times we want to overcomplicate it we want to make it this uh, whole long drawn out thing of all these works that we have to do, but that's not it. Our preparation to accept him has to do with one admitting that we are a sinner. Scripture tells us that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none of us on this earth today that are perfect. We've all sinned. We've all messed up. We've all told a lie. We've all done something we shouldn't have. We were born with a sin nature. The second step is to believe. And that's the right person part. It is believed that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he is the son of God, that he came and lived here on earth for 33 years, that he died on the cross, that he didn't deserve to, but he did it out of his love for you and I, and believe that he died for you, and that he, through his shedding of blood, we can have remission of our sins. He hung on the cross, he died, but three days later, he rose again, and he is sitting at the right hand of the Father today in heaven. The third thing you have to do is confess. Confess that you're a sinner and confess that he is, uh, you, that you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior and go out and tell others what he's done for you. And the right place, the right place is speaking of the cross. Anytime, any place on earth, you're ready to accept the Lord. He's right there with you. He's ready. All we have to do is look towards the cross and look towards Jesus and do those simple steps that I outlined for you. And he will make you one of his own. You can become a child of God. You can have uh, the remission of sin, the forgiveness of all your sins. That it doesn't matter what you've done, how good you've been, how bad you've been. Sin is sin. There's no level of it. His blood is powerful enough to wash it all away. See, once we come to Jesus and accept him as our Lord and Savior, he forgets all that stuff that we've done in the past. You know, a lot of times as humans, we don't want to forget people's mistakes, but Jesus does. Once we plead the blood of Jesus, it's all washed, it's all covered by the blood. It's never to be seen again by the Lord. Now I want to speak to those that are Christians, and maybe you've um, backslidden. Maybe you've, maybe you've never sold out 100% for Jesus. Maybe you took the first step, but maybe you didn't go all the way. We see here in the story of Ruth chapter 3. Uh, we look at the four rights that we have to do as Christians. You know, we've got to have the right purpose. What is our purpose for our relationship with Jesus Christ? Are we looking for that long-term relationship? Are we expecting that? Or are we just expecting somebody that pops in when we need them to solve our problems and then we're ready to push them away and forget about them until life gets so bad we can't dig ourselves out of our hole? We've got to have that right purpose. We need to expect that Jesus will be there with us every step of the way and have that relationship with him. We need to talk to him. We need to uh, study his word. We need to have that long lasting daily relationship with him. The right person. We already know who the right person is. It's Jesus Christ. We've taken the first step. But we need to make sure we don't forget that. The right preparations. As a Christian what is our right preparations that we need to do? Well we need to do on a daily basis. We need to prepare ourselves for life. For Christian life here in a foreign land. 
That means we need to be in prayer. That means we need to be in our Bible. That means we need to talk to Jesus on a daily basis, not just on Sundays, not just on when the church doors are open, but we need to have that uh, continual uh, relationship with him on a daily basis. We need to prepare ourselves for battle, prepare ourselves that when we go out into the world, into the mission field, we are in the right place. We are in the right uh, frame of mind that we are, uh, we are ready to go. And the fourth thing is the right place. The right place is right where God has you. If God tells you to go here, God tells you to go there, that's where we need to be. The right place is wherever he commands us to be. Even though that may seem hard, uh, obviously if uh, you know the Lord tells you you need to pick up and you've got to move overseas, it's not going to be an easy move. But it's going to be easier being overseas exactly where God tells you to be than it's going to be outside of his will here. Uh, think of the story of Jonah. Uh, you can't run from God. Wherever God tells us to be, that's the right place. Even though it's, uh, it's not always going to be an easy life, most of the time it's going to be a hard life. But that's okay. Jesus is right there with us. He said he'd never leave us or forsake us. So we need to be in the right place that he calls us to be. So as we think about this and we think, well, what do we need to do this week? Make sure you're making the right preparations on a daily basis. Make sure you're in the right place where God tells you to be. Make sure we're continuing to look to the right person. We need to make sure that we've not let any idols slide in there. We've not let anything slide up on the priority list and bump Jesus down. And make sure we're expecting that daily relationship with him. Let us pray. Dearly Father, Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to be back here this morning. Lord, I just thank you for everyone that's tuned in and spent part of their day here with us online. Lord, I just pray we could take the message here in Ruth chapter 3. Uh, that we could be more like her, Lord, that we would totally sell out, that we would be 100% committed to you, that we would always look to you, Lord, for everything, that we would make our preparations on a daily basis as we go out into the mission field, Lord, and we do spiritual battle, Lord. I just pray that we would continuously look to you, that we would be obedient, and that we would have the faith that we need to to do the job we need to while we're here on earth, Lord. Lord, I just pray you would be with every member of the congregation, Lord, be with everyone that's watching here today, Lord. Just guide us, protect us, Lord. Just open our eyes that we would know what we need to do, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching with us this morning. Uh, be back with us tonight. We'll be back at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. So tune in with us then. Thank you for watching. God bless.